It's kind of interesting. Many languages this day, they have some kind of functional programming capabilities. For example, they have anonymous functions, they have higher order functions, they have some kind of immutability, lazy collections and stuff like that. And one of those languages is JavaScript. But even though JavaScript has all of those uh, functional programming capabilities, you won't be able to just open the Haskell code and understand it. Haskell is a pure functional programming language and JavaScript has functional programming capabilities. So just by knowing JavaScript, why can't you read Haskell? Well, obviously, not obviously, I don't think it's obvious. The problem is pure functional programming is not about that. It's not about anonymous functions. Pure functional programming is about composing pure functions. And pure function is just a mapper. It takes one object and produces another. It doesn't modify the objects it takes, it just takes one object and produces another one. And the really important trait of that function is that no matter how many times you put the same object to that function, it should always produce the same result. And pure functional programming is about composing those functions together. So what I decided to do today is to take a look at pure functional programming from the JavaScript point of view. I'm going to do all my explanations in JavaScript REPL, but standard Node.js REPL sucks, so we're going to do a simple trick. First, I'm going to take my browser and open about blank. Then I'm going to open DevTools and switch to the console. So let's actually detach DevTools, make the font a little bit bigger and customize the appearance of it. Now it looks pretty cool. To understand pure functional programming from the JavaScript point of view, we have to apply some limitations on that language. Those limitations are not limitations of functional programming. They are rather limitations that you have to apply specifically to JavaScript to understand pure functional programming. So the first limitation is going to be, we are not going to use any loops. We're not going to use for loop, while loop, whatever you have, the loops are not allowed. The second limitation is no if conditions, but ternary operator is okay though. And the third limitation is that the body of the function should always consist of a single return. There should be nothing in the body of the function, only a single return and some expression in the return. It doesn't matter the size of that expression, it should be always the return and that expression. So how can you even write anything useful in that style? Well, if you need loop, you can use recursion. Recursion is outside of the scope of this video, but if you're not familiar with it, I strongly recommend you to take a look at the computer file video about recursion by Professor Brailsford. It's a pretty good video and I think it explains recursion pretty well. Let's try to implement a function that takes some number i and produces a sum from 1 to i. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that through recursion and any recursion has some kind of base. In our case, the base is going to be when i is less or equal to zero. That means the result of this function is zero. If it's not, the result of this function i plus sum i minus one. Now let's check it. So let's calculate sum from one to ten and it's 55. From 1 to 100, 5050. Let's take a look closer at this function. This function complies to the limitations. It doesn't use any loops. It doesn't use if construction. It uses only ternary operator. And the body of the function consists of a single return. Here we have a return and just a single expression. So it's a purely functional function. Functional function. But these three limitations are not the only limitations. Another limitation is no side effects. By side effect, we usually mean something that happens to the outside world. For example, pure functions are not allowed to print on the console. Printing on the console is considered a side effect. Well, obviously with this limitation, we cannot implement a program that interacts with the user. It cannot, because any interaction with the user requires side effect. So when we do a pure functional programming, we usually divide our program into two parts. The first part is pure functional part, which doesn't do any side effects. And another part is, let's call it dirty part. It does interaction with the user and this part is not pure functional. Well, that actually implies that you cannot implement something useful purely functional. But Surprisingly enough, the dirty part of your program can be really, really small. From my subjective experience, it's like you can make it 1% of your program. Another limitation is no assignments inside of functions. We're going to do a lot of variable assignments in the REPL on the high level, but assigning variables inside of function is not allowed because when your function assigns a variable, that might be a side effect. It's only a side effect when you assign a global variable, but we do not allow any kind of assignment. Another interesting limitation is 
no arrays. We are not allowed to use any arrays, but we can use objects though, and I will show how we can work around that limitation. And the last very interesting limitation is that every function can have only zero or one argument. The last one actually sounds a, bit, a little bit ridiculous, because how can you program with functions that takes up to one argument? What if I need a function with two arguments? For example, I want to define a function add that takes two arguments, and it just calculates the sum of these arguments. How can I implement such function? Well, there is a, a simple trick to work around that limitation. We have to define a function that takes one argument, just one argument, the first one, and that function returns another function that takes the second argument. And inside of the second function, we already do the work that we wanted to do. And to invoke that function, you invoke the first function, then that function returns another function, and then you invoke that function. So this is how you do that. And this is how you work around that limitation. And take a closer look at that function. It's purely functional. Each function consists of a single return. This return returns another function, which also consists of a single return. I'm just looking at the limitations. We don't have any side effects. We don't have any assignments inside of functions. We don't use any arrays. It's purely functional and it works around the last limitation. But the problem is this expression is kind of ugly. But with ES6 fat arrow lambdas, you can actually make it pretty like that. Now we have to think how can we work around the limitation of no arrays. We're going to use functional lists. Functional lists are just a chain of pairs. A pair is some container that can hold two values. Traditionally, there are like three operations for pairs. The first operation is to construct a pair. The function that constructs the pair takes two arguments. So let's use our usual trick. First argument, the second argument. And now we have to construct a pair. Since we are allowed to use objects, we can just implement pairs as objects. The second operation is taking the first element of the pair. It's usually called something like FST. It takes a pair and returns the first element of the pair. And the last operation we need is the operation that takes the second element of the pair. Now, having the pairs, we can easily chain them into a list. So let's denote an empty list with null. If we see null, that means it's an empty list. If we want to add an element to an empty list, we pair that empty list with some element, for example, one. This is a list with a single element. If we want to add another element to the list, we pair that list with another element, like so. Now it's a list of two elements, two and one, and we continue infinitely. So it's basically a functional list with three elements. I think this list is going to be really useful, so I want to save it into a separate variable. Basically, if you have a functional list access, FST operation on that list takes the head of the list, and SND operation takes the tail of the list, the rest of the elements without the head. To make that semantic a little bit more obvious, let's assign some aliases for head and tail. So head is going to be first, and tail is going to be SND. So now it's more obvious. So we're taking the head of the list and we're taking a tail of the list. Inspecting functional lists like that is not really convenient, so I'm proposing to make some kind of bridge between functional world and dirty imperative world. This bridge is going to be just a couple of functions that take functional lists and convert them to arrays. Arrays are not allowed in functional world, in our functional world, but they are completely okay if we want to just inspect the result of the working functional program. So let's just implement that. So we're going to have a function list to array. It takes a list, a functional list and produces the array. Since this function is just a bridge between functional world and imperative world, we're not going to apply any functional limitations on that function and we're going to implement it in an imperative way. So you see, we start with an empty accumulator, then while functional list is not empty, we push the head of the function list to the result and take a tail of the list, and then we just return it. So what we can do, we can just try this function out on access, and yeah, it produces the result 3, 2, 1, and this is exactly what we encoded in that functional list. Now we probably want to have an opposite operation because it's really inconvenient to encode your functional list like that. So it would be easier to just define an array 
convert it to a functional list and pass it to the functional world to some pure function. Let's define a function array to list. This function is going to take not just array, but array like object. Since we're converting array to list, the accumulator is going to be functional list. So the empty functional list is null. Then we traverse the array like object. And on each iteration, we pair together the ith element of the array and the current result. After that, we just return the accumulator. But there is a problem because that will actually construct a reversed array. So to resolve that problem, before traversing array-like object, we have to reverse it. And then while constructing a functional object, it will be reversed back. So let's just actually see how that function works. So I am constructing an array of one, two, three, and that should construct a functional list from one to three. And yeah, as you can see, it's a functional list from one to three. We can even take our functional list access, then construct array out of that list list and construct list back and just see that it works. Yeah, it still works. And this function works with strings as well. Yeah, you see it's a functional list of strings and stuff. Now we have our pure functional base. So what we're gonna do? I think we're gonna solve a couple of coding interview problems. We're gonna start with the famous FizzBuzz problem. This problem goes like so. You have to print numbers from one to 100, but if the number is divisible by three, you should print Fizz instead. If the number is divisible by five, you should print Buzz. And if the number is divisible by both, you have to print FizzBuzz. Okay, since in pure functional programming, we cannot have any side effects, the function that will solve the problem won't print anything. In our case, this function will just return a functional list, but if the number is divisible by three, it's going to return fees and so on. And then later we will be able to convert that list into array and just validate that the function solves the problem correctly. So let's try to solve a more simple problem. How do you just generate numbers from one to 100? We're going to implement a simple function called range, which takes two arguments. It takes the low, which which is the low boundary of the range and high, which is the higher boundary of the range. So now we can generate a range via the recursion. What's the base of that recursion? I believe that the base of the recursion is when low is higher than high. When low is higher than high, that means there is nothing to generate. It's an empty list. If the lower is equal or less than high, there is something to generate. We pair the low with a recursive call to the range, the range that is a little bit smaller, the range which is low plus one, Hi. Uh, let's see how this function works. Let's generate numbers from 1 to 100. And yeah, so it generates some number, but it's really inconvenient to uh, inspect them. So let's convert the pure functional list to an array and ensure that it's array from 1 to 100. We just implemented a function that generates a range from 1 to 100 in a purely functional way. Once we generated numbers from 1 to 100, it only remains to replace some of those numbers with fizz, buzz, or fizz buzz. For replacing elements of a functional list, functional programmers have a special operation. They usually call it map. This operation takes a function and a list where you want to make a replacement. So what that function basically does, it goes through the list, applies that function to each and individual element of the list and produces a new list, which is a mapping produced by that function. Okay, let's just try to implement that function. It's a recursive function, of course. Base is going to be when the list is empty. When the list is empty, there is nothing to map. So we just return an empty list. If the list is not empty, we pair two things, the result of the F function to the head of the list. And we pair that element with mapped tail of the list. So this is a recursive definition. Let's check how this function works. Let's generate a range from one to 10. Let's map that range with something. Let's actually map it with a function that takes an element and multiplies it by itself. And let's convert a list to array for easy inspection. That will generate the squares from one to 10. Yeah, that's what it does. Having these two operations, range and map, we can solve FizzBuzz. It only remains to implement a function that solves FizzBuzz for a single number. So let's create a function FizzBuzz. That function takes a number and should return just a number. String Fizz if the number is divisible by three. String Buzz if the number is divisible by five. And FizzBuzz if the number is divisible by boss. We're going to have some condition that returns FizzBuzz or FizzBuzz depending on the divisionness. 
And if there is nothing to replace it with, this expression should return something empty, for example, empty string. And now we or it with the actual number. First thing we do, we check whether a number is divisible by three. We do that by a mod operation. So if the number is divisible by three, so we actually have to triple equal, we return fees. If the number is not divisible by three, we return nothing. This is the first condition. So in any case, this condition returns a string. We're gonna concatenate that with another condition for five. And as you can see, if n is divisible by five, it will return buzz. And if the n is divisible by both, it will return fees buzz because we concatenate both of the expressions. And if n is not divisible by any of those, this entire expression is going to be empty list. And empty list is considered to be false in JavaScript, so this entire expression will return n. Now we can even check that. If we apply it to 1, it will return 1. If we apply it to 3, it will return fees. If we apply it to 5, it will return buzz. And if we apply it to 15, it will return fees buzz. The only thing remains is to generate a range from 1 to 1. 100 and map that range with this buzz and of course convert it to array just to be able to easily read all of that. And here you go, we solved this bus problem in a purely functional way. Now let's try to solve that problem in Haskell. To generate a range in Haskell, you just have to do that. Range generation is built into language. The map operation is also already implemented. So the only thing remains is to implement the fizzbuzz function. First, we define a function with name fizzbuzz that takes one argument n. And we sequentially check three conditions. If n is divisible by 15, we return fizzbuzz. If n is divisible by 3, we return fizz. If n is divisible by 5, we return buzz. Otherwise, we just return n. Let's compile this function and check it inside of the REPL. For 1, it will return 1. For 3, it will return fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz. So the entire solution in Haskell is gonna look like that. So as you can see, it's really similar to the solution that we implemented in JavaScript. That was pretty interesting journey. I don't expect that after this video, you will instantly understand Haskell, but I really hope that I provided you some starting point in understanding the semantic of this language. Okay, I guess that's it for this video and I see you on the next one.